Welcome to the City of Santa Clarita's New Heights Artist Development Series. Today we have music and film, the composer's role, and I'm really excited about the three women that are speaking today about the role of music and film, which is such an important aspect of music. Anyone who's worked in film or television, you know when you're watching that dry cut that doesn't have the music yet, you know how much it matters. So I'm really excited to talk about this today. I actually am also a classically trained pianist, so music has a little special place in my heart as well as a filmmaker. Um, and before we get started, I am a filmmaker, Jennifer Fisher, writer, director, uh, producer. Um, and I just wanna share a couple of my favorite um, films regarding music. So I love Once, which is not a film score, but it's a lot of great music by some talented artists. And they really, um, unlike most musicals, make it really seamless in the way that the music enters the film. And then I really love Millions by Danny Boyle, which is a lesser known film of his, but the music in that is quite lovely. And City of God is another one that I really like that um, a lot of people don't think of the music when they think of those films or may not know those films, but they're two of my favorites. So now I'm gonna let the panelists introduce themselves and we'll go Trinity, Dara, Edith, because that's the way I see you on my screen. So yeah, you guys introduce yourselves and then we'll get rolling on this wonderful discussion. Great, thank you very much, Jen. I really appreciate being a part of this panel and um, sharing the space with some wonderful women. So I am a composer for film and media, public speaker and educator. I teach at University of North Carolina School of the Arts in the MFA Film Music Composition Program. And I speak at festivals and conferences on how to successfully work with a composer as well as the science behind film scoring. I, uh, I started my business in 2010, it's called Real Scoring. Um, I then pursued my MFA in film music composition, went to Los Angeles uh, as a Television Academy Foundation intern, worked as an assistant for a while, and then came back to Charlotte, North Carolina to pursue my business full time. So um, yeah, so I'm, I'm a teacher and I love educating um, and I will be pursuing my PhD in the fall in music theory with a specialization in cognitive and behavioral sciences and my research will be focusing on how music cultivates empathy through media and how we can change perceptions of gender and race in media by what music we use. Thank you. Great. Um, hi, I'm Dara Taylor. I'm also really thankful to be here. Um, I am a composer for film and television, uh, mostly. Um, I've worked on a variety of independent and um, studio films. Um, most recently, um, I co-scored Barb and Star Go to Vista Del Mar with uh, Chris Leonards. And, um, and then I uh, scored a uh, Michael Shannon thriller called Echo Boomers. Um, and I'm LA based, um, New York raised, and just happy to be here. Thank you. So happy to be here with you guys. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Edith Mudge, and um, I'm also a composer. Uh, I work in a variety of media. Um, <clears throat> I primarily have worked in production music, um, and that's essentially like licensable tracks that end up in a lot of like reality series, etc. Um, I do television scoring, film scoring, um, and I also do a lot of assisting other composers in whatever uh, whatever arenas they need. So uh, whether that's um, organization, orchestration, uh, music preparation, um, I I have a variety of skills, and I get to use them widely on every different project. So every day is different and. Great, and that segues well, because what I wanna start with is the variety of roles in music. You know, a lot of times when we think about music in film or television and we forget, there's also commercials, there's video games. Like if you wanna write music for media, there's a wide playground right now to play in. Um, and also we think of just the composer um, and we think of the big names, John Williams, Hans Zimmerman, but there's a lot more people writing music. I mean, think about every piece of media you engage with has music. Every 15 second commercial, right, that pops up on your YouTube, it all has music. 
So there's such a wide range of roles, someone who's a musician or a music student that wants to break into this business. There's a wider range of roles. So I want to speak about that. Like you said, you've assisted composers. Like what are the different roles in media and music that people can do? Because I think we think of composer, but there's so much more than that. So what are some other roles in music that people may not think of or that can be useful when someone's trying to break in and get started? So what are, what are some of those um, opportunities and places to look and to, to get going? Music supervision is one uh, that's more of the entertainment law and also, well, you should have a good background in entertainment law, uh, but also it's supervision puts their hands or supervisors put their hands in multiple pots and they basically work with filmmakers and say, okay, what kind of music do you need for this film? Do you need a licensed piece? Do you need uh, an original composer? Do you need, uh, you know, do we need a live for a local band or et cetera, et cetera. So they're the ones who pretty much overlook the different kinds of music. Um, and then there's also music editors there. Uh, and there's two different kinds. There's the music editors for filmmakers who they just uh, make sure that the music that they're putting in fits the scene. Sometimes they do for temp tracks Temp tracks, for those who don't know, it's temporarily placed pieces of music that is used for reference for the composer. And, um, and then there's the composer's music editor where if there's a cut in the film that happens after the music has been recorded, the music editor comes in and they edit the music to fit the new edit. And there's yeah. plenty of more, but I'm not gonna take all the roles. <laughs> that also just reminds me of um, how many different like areas sort of industries of music there are and even within different industries say like ad music or like podcast music or film and tv within all of those all of the um job titles kind of shift a little bit so for example um you know I've always learned about scoring film and tv but if you're talking podcast scoring is not the same thing it's when they take the the licensed tracks and music edit them basically <laughs> into the podcast. So um, it can really depend on where you're putting your focus um, because the language really actually has multiple meanings, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, also orchestrating um, and copying are a good way to get to know people and to get to know um, other composers as well. Um, I know a decent amount of people who started off in orchestrating and copying and then, you know, developed a relationship with X, Y, or Z and then their career has taken steps from there. Um, I guess I took a slightly more traditional route and um, I mean, sort of, uh, when I first came to LA, um, I started, um, volunteering for uh, the, the Society of Composers and Lyricists, it's just like t doing check-in and getting to know people and getting to know faces because I knew no one. Um, and from there, I met a friend who, um, who took me with her to a scoring session um, for Revolution at the time. And that is where I first met Chris Lennart. And um, after that, I started interning for him and then I was studio manager um, at Sonic Fuel for about five months because the studio manager was leaving. So kind of like staying generally useful. And then I was a part-time assistant, then a full-time assistant, then um, and then additional writing and score producing until I um, eventually broke off on my own. So I took a um, kind of a rung of a ladder approach, but there are so many different ways to get there. <laughs> Actually, yeah, I wanted darn. to add both. Oh. If you don't, well, sorry, did, did sorry. you want to say something? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was just going to say that's sort of similar to my story as well, except instead of Sonic Fuel and at RCP. <laughs> so it's like Remote doing control. the assistant route is can be a really good springboard to just like figuring out what it is that composers do, what the other people they work with do, and what you want to do. <laughs> and actually, I just wanted to further explain because I know a lot of people don't know what orchestrating or copying means. Mm -hmm. um, so this is my professor hat I'm putting on. Good. <laughs> uh, but uh, for orchestrators, so let's say a composer hires an orchestrator, a composer will write, let's say a piano reduction, like a simple theme or a simple melody um, or something that's just written for piano. An orchestrator will come in and basically 
um, expand upon that piano reduction and write the different parts for the orchestra. So that's an orchestrator or a person who arranges the music to where it fits a specific ensemble or size or et cetera, uh, instrumentation, right? And the copyist then helps the orchestrator in dividing each one of these parts into um, individual sheet music or pieces of sheet music so that the instrumentalist can come in and perform the music live so or record the music. So you can also have musicians and you'll have engineers and you'll have audio engineers and you'll have um, multiple assistants. And actually I wanted to mention one more job and that is, it's kind of a silent gig, but it's the tracker. And uh, trackers are people who, especially helping television composers who have a lot of projects, what they do is they, they are, they're usually present during scoring sessions to break apart the layers of the score and record those layers individually so that they can compile them later and create new pieces of music. But it's still, it's still written by the composer, but it's in a sense arranged by the tracker in order to create these new cues for television. So it's, it provides a lot of help so that's not constantly writing from scratch each one of these cues. Yeah, well, yeah. and I love, the oh excuse me real quick I love the wealth of what you guys are relaying because I was a um, piano major in college initially and was kind of like I love music and I love piano I hate being a piano major I don't want to be a solo piano performer but you know in you know 19 late 90s in like a traditional music school in Indiana no one was putting forward to me any of these other options right that like there were a myriad things I could do with this wealth of musical knowledge and skill that I'd been building for most of my life. And so I love that like now I think there's more of that getting out there. An event like this is also doing that, that people that do love music and love playing, but maybe they're, they're not into whatever one little thing they've been shown, that there's a million ways that you can use your musical skill and use your love for music to like be creative and to be involved in film, television, gaming, whatever kind of your favorite media is, like there's so much available and I, I love the wealth that you guys are showing. Yeah, well, another thing about that um, is that I think at least probably when we were starting our careers, like it wasn't super visible that women were in these careers and that women were really involved in the film industry at all or that um, like, especially that we were doing the technical things. Um, so I know that at least for myself, like um, even like coming of age in the music industry, like a decade ago, like it felt like it wasn't possible for me to learn any of these uh, skills if I didn't like innately know them at birth or something like, um, <laughs> so uh, I think it's really just important for people to know. I like to let people know that like, these are learnable skills. Like this is not something that I knew when I started my career. It's something you learn as you go. Right, totally. Yeah. And what are your musical backgrounds? You know, I, I trained classically in piano. And so there's some things that have been great about that in, in film. And then there's some times where I wish like, oh, I wish I had more of a background in jazz or blues, or I could improv more, you know? So I'm curious to know what are each of your kind of musical backgrounds that got you to the places where you are. I mean, go I, this time. Yeah, go. Yeah, go oh, ahead, Dora. <laughs> um, I mean, I always feel like, oh, I wish I would have done more of X, Y, or Z before it's approached. <laughs> um, but, the, but the next time it comes up, then I did do some of it. So, um, I mean, I studied as a vocalist and I had a kind of a similar um, experience as Jen did where I realized I don't, I don't want to sing professionally. <laughs> this isn't what, because <laughs> I, you know, I, I studied as a mezzo-soprano, so I was like studying art songs and arias, and um, I don't know. I think, first of all, I just didn't have the neck to pull up all of those big opera scarves. Um, but also, um, yeah, just standing in front of a whole bunch of people, like projecting my voice. I'm not a shy person, but it's not really what, what got me going. Um, and then I kind of started um, getting a little more serious about composition in college. Um, and I mean, kind of to Edith's point, um, I'm not going to say necessarily because I was a woman, but um, it, at undergrad, 
um, you know, we had a lot of grad students that were a little pretentious. Um, and I hid the fact that I wanted to do film music for um, until it was time to uh, apply for grad school. Um, and, um, and, you know, um, at undergrad, we usually started studying under a grad student first uh, when we first started composition and then would kind of graduate to one of the faculty faculty members. Um, and I looked around at all the grad students. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to share my music that feels so like frail and fragile to me with any of these people. And then the sophomore year, um, a new grad student came in uh, named Zachary Wadsworth, and he is a fantastic um, uh, contemporary classical composer. He does a lot of choral work. And I'm like, oh, he's lovely. So I studied with him and, um, you know, it always just kind of takes like this, sometimes it takes one person or one project or something to make you, that makes you think, okay, I, I can at least give it a shot. So um, yeah, it, it's kind of finding your voice and finding your purpose within that voice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. Um, it's funny. So I actually started with forensic chemistry in undergrad. And uh, cause I come from a family of engineers and medical professionals. So the pressure was STEM, STEM, STEM. And so I studied forensic chemistry my first year. I was very good at it um, and actually if I, in another world, I probably would have studied biochemistry and become some foodologist or whatever, because <laughs> um, I just love how food affects the brain and whatnot. Um, so after that, uh, a childhood friend of mine had passed away and it was kind of that wake up call that, hmm, life is a little too short. And so I might as well just do what I love. So I transferred uh, to Chapel Hill, uh, UNC Chapel Hill and I studied music and, um, and then focused on composition. And after that, living in the real world for a few years, not really knowing anything about film scoring, even though that's, that has been my passion. I, I did an independent study, like I learned off of YouTube videos on how to work with Logic, which is the software and DAWs and you know, virtual instruments and whatnot, and wasn't going anywhere. So then I went for the MFA in film music. Um, and yeah, the rest is pretty much history, you know, being in LA, coming back here, and now I'm going for a PhD. So um, my brain is very much wired to be scientific and mathematical. Um, so that's why, like, I've developed a series of workshops talking about the science behind film scoring and how it psychologically impacts and creates uh, an association with the audience and the idea of immortalizing film through this. Um, but anyway, so basically, my background, like, all through grade school, I've always did music. I sang, I played saxophone, piano, um, and then again, started college with science because pressure, pressure, pressure. And then I ended up with music anyway. <laughs> you guys are both so interesting. This is fascinating. <laughs> um, so I think for me, like a big part of my journey has been having no idea what I want <laughs> and like no idea what I want to do with music. And honestly, that's, it's worked out really well. Um, it was a panic for a long time, but it's worked out great. So I went to college for music. I'm also a trained mezzo-soprano, um, but couldn't rock the scarves either. So had no idea what to do with that um, and played piano all growing up and, um, you know, I did a little bit of composition in college, but it was a general music major. So it wasn't like a specialized course or anything. Um, and once I graduated, um, I mean, I, I basically like moved in with a boyfriend in New York and was like, I'm going to do the singer songwriter thing. And it just, it didn't work. You know, um, I think we've all tried the singer songwriter thing and it was, coming out of college is like a really hard transitional time, I think. Um, so I had that obvious like terrible breakup and was, things weren't working out in uh, New York or like I was trying to do like four part-time jobs and I was never performing. And I was like, what do I do? <laughs> so I was like, I guess I'll move to LA and see what happens. And that's pretty much what I did, like crashed on people's couches and then like 
got an internship at RCT and was assisting there. And I was like, well, this is music related. Like I never even, I, I've never been a person who has said like, I love film music. Like I honestly never paid attention to film music until I was in it. And now I love it, obviously, but um, I'm not one of the people that like really paid attention to that my whole life. Um, but like the more I was working with it, the more I was like, oh my God, this is awesome. Because actually originally I came to LA thinking, I've heard that orchestration is cool and I really like working with notation software. So that sounds like a fun job, I'll try to do that. And while I was interning, I went to a um, panel of the Alliance of Women Film Composers and saw all of them talking about their composition experience and they were expressing similar things that I was feeling about like not having known tech skills, but like it was okay. And all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, I just, I had no idea that this was actually an option. So went to it from there, uh, just a bunch of people, um, then spent two years uh, writing in-house at a music library and um, been freelance for a couple of years. Well, and I think the tech really can be a big, boundary for a lot of people and so it's really knowing like trinity i love like you're like i just learned on youtube i mean so people know like you can do that you don't have to it, it's okay to do that we can all teach ourselves new skills you know and my partner he did the same thing like he uh decided he wanted to learn coding he never took a class he just like watched a lot of youtube tutorials and now he's coding and creating vr and interactive things and i think we can have limiting beliefs about ourselves and maybe girls or women are conditioned to have them more when it comes to technology, but there is nothing about us inherently that makes technology harder. <laughs> like it's just not yeah. true. So it's a lot of messaging that's out in the ether, but it's not actually true. So I, I love that. It's like just pushing ourselves through some of those thoughts or just trying something new, watching YouTube videos, meeting people, hearing these stories, connecting to professional groups. And then it opens up whole new avenues of exploration for us. So now let's get down to the music writing. How do you guys approach scores? You know, what inspires you? What's your method? What's your, um, when you have an assignment, you've got to write something for a piece. You know, how do you go about that? How do you approach that? That is a loaded question. Yeah, it's the eternal <laughs> question. <laughs> Everybody always wants to know this, right? Always. And the so, answer is always, it depends, which like, yeah. I wish that we had a better answer. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And it depends on the person too, because everybody's creative process is different. I mean, um, I'm also a visual artist. So like everybody paints differently, you know, do they actually outline or do they just go onto the canvas? Do they gesso their canvas first? Do they, you know, there's all these different things to prepare for the process and then how do they add layers? And it's, it's the same thing with music. So um, I mostly work in film. So, um, and I guess commercial and, and games as well, but I need something to start with. So uh, with film, it starts with the script and breaking down the script. This is actually one of my classes, um, breaking down the script and answering the questions, who, what, where, when, why, and how do I answer those questions through music? Um, the number one thing that I ask filmmakers is what is the question or what is the message you are trying to convey with this film? that message is what I am uh, conveying or portraying through the score. And so trying with that message, we figure out, okay, what are the key concepts within the story that need to theme? All right, well, then how are these themes going to sound? And basically it's based off of the tropes and the patterns that have been developed over time. Um, like how do you embody innocence? right with music and it's things that are of lighter nature things that are not as um heavy or mature sounding so light woodwinds or if it's like a child oftentimes there's a clock or a, or a celeste or <clears throat> or these other things <clears throat> sorry i'm getting so excited i <clears throat> anyway so um so based off of the characteristics of whatever's carrying these themes that's how I approach them with instrumentation, melody, <clears throat> excuse me, harmonies and texture. So it's a whole process of adding those layers and how can we change them in order to fit 
these, um, I guess you could even say these expectations or these tropes, excuse me, someone else can go because I really need to cough. <laughs> no, I, I, I love that because it also pushes it back to the filmmaker coming from a producer side, you know, and it makes you make sure you've really defined those things. And also I, I ran a film festival for years and there's times where you're like, man, you need to really thank your, your composer because you didn't have the emotional weight, you know, with something independent, maybe the acting, they didn't cast well enough. It's like, that emotion is all right there because of your music. <laughs> it's not coming through any other way. And, and in a really great piece, all of those things are working together, but sometimes it is the music that's making you feel sad or anxious or, you know, nervous or whatever, that's really giving you the trigger. Um, but I think it's like, it's interesting to hear how composers can come back to filmmakers and make sure we've done our job, that we know what we're trying to convey because otherwise you're not gonna be able to do your job if we can't you know, tell you this is what we're trying to convey. So yeah, can you all, um, Dara and Edith, add on to that or, or share differences or, or what works for you all? Yeah, I mean, um, usually the, the piece is what inspires me um, as that is the job. And, <laughs> but, um, to me, it's always also trying to find something a little out of the ordinary to add into it that really speaks to that particular film, whether it's like, um, you know, using some sort of like found percussion that relates to it or um, having a really kind of signature process sound to something that um, that is associated with a particular character. Um, I mean, as far as my process goes, yeah, after uh, spotting, um, which is going through the music with the uh, filmmaker or going through the film with the, with the filmmaker and um, defining where you want music to come in and go out um, and also the tone of that music. And then if there is temp music, whether or not they like it or hate it um, or somewhere in between, and it's also good to find out, you know, is that, do you like the tempo? Do you like how thick or thin it is? Um, finding out, from the get-go whether or not they like things more synthetic or organic or a combo of the two. If a combo of the two, what should lead um, the synths or the organic sounds? Um, whether or not they like a lot of big sweeping melodies or if they like smaller motifs that um, won't do, won't um, distract at all from what's happening and they just kind of want there to be texture. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, when I start, I, I'm a sketcher. Um, I didn't, I don't think I always used to be. I used to like try and start a piece and then finish a piece. But um, as things got busier, um, I realized how stressed out I get by blank pages um, or blank screens. Um, I'm like, just get something down and then go on to the next one and get something down and then come back tomorrow and realize how horrible it is and start again. But at least you did something that day. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I mean, as much prep work as possible, um, but also realizing that you can always just ask them questions as you go along. Um, because I, I've also done the opposite and um, or I've learned from the opposite and have kind of made my own inference about a character or something. It's like, oh, they're, they're the guy, gotcha. Um, <laughs> which I guess kind of goes to Jen's point, but yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, communication is is key. And a lot of times filmmakers will say, well, I don't know anything about music. I'm like, fine, wonderful. Um, just talk to me like you talk to an actor. And it's therefore my job to interpret that and um, turn that into music. We are the emotional translators. Yeah. <laughs> I love the idea of talking to us like an actor. That's such a great point, Dara. Yeah, um, yeah I... Uh, I think maybe one of the things that's worked in my favor in terms of being somebody that didn't like come from the film music fandom is that I didn't have the expectation coming in that um, film music was like a direct expression of my soul. Um, and I think that a lot of people come in with that um, idea and truly like it, it's, so it's such a collaborative um, a collaborative process um and I also like to make sure that the filmmaker and I are going to be on the same page and really go into detail like not so much about music but about mood and about like where are we seeing the mood change like what is causing the mood to change um and 
how do we, like, what do we want the scene to evoke? Um, and so in that way, um, the film composer has to really be a bit of a mind reader. And um, that's something that I'm really thankful that I assisted for a long time to learn because um, there are like specific keywords that um, maybe like non-musicians would use to, um, to evoke a certain thing. Like, as you were saying, Trinity, like innocence is gonna be like, you know, higher woodwinds than a Glock. Like, um, I think that those are things that I may not have um, understood if I didn't see a lot of people doing them for a long time. Um, but also it's, um, it can be fun to like play with those norms. And I know that like one example of this would be like, um, like interstellar, like Hans Zimmer, like turning the space, like synth kind of trope into like an organ. Like I think that's really fun to do stuff like that. And also fun to take themes from, um, from the piece of media that you're using and turn them into an instrument. Um, and in terms of creative process, like it's so different every time, but I think I'm a person that gets one idea in my head and I'm like, all right, well, let's see where this takes me. <laughs> like lay down one instrument, lay down a melody, put it in a bunch of instruments, see where it goes. And then like, once I've been messing with something and just like playing with it for hours to the point where I just hate everything, all of a sudden it comes together. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, okay, here's where I'm going. <laughs> Actually a word that so many filmmakers use and as a concert trained musician slash composer, minimalism. When a filmmaker is like, I want a minimalist approach. And what they really mean is like really thin or simple, but it's like, hmm, in concert music, uh, mm -hmm. minimalism means repetitive uh, patterns, right? And multiple patterns, like you think of Philip Glass or um, Reich, or, you know, it's just the same pattern over and over and over again. And it's like, that's not really what you mean, dude. But no. I have learned from my experiences with filmmakers that this is actually what you mean. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And I think um, that to me, like, serves the point that like, it's almost better for us to collaborate together for mood and not like almost every um, creative that I work with who needs music comes to me and they're like, I feel so self-conscious because I have no idea how to talk music. And I'm like, that is okay. Like, let's just not talk about music. I'll send you some samples and you can see if you like it, tell me what you like and what you don't like. But, um, but the most important thing is like, let's just talk about how you want to feel. <laughs> well, and it's great. You guys actually anticipated my next question, which is, you know, the relationship with the director and talking to directors, because um, in the low budget world, micro budget world, sometimes I've just arranged on the piano for our independent films when we didn't have the budget for a composer for some little spot we were doing. And my partner knows nothing about music and so we're talking to each other and because I don't have the training you guys have, I'm just like losing my mind and he's losing his mind. And then it's more complicated by like a 20 year relationship with each other too. It's like, <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> I wish I had had these tips because you know, musicians, we talk differently when we're talking with each other and directors talk differently, but yeah, they can talk to us the way they talk to actors or they can talk to you all the way they talk to actors or the way they talk to a set designer, right? Or a costume designer. They're doing the same thing. They're setting a mood. Why does this character always wear red? Well, that means something to you as a composer. This is our character always in red. What are you trying to convey with that? And then how can the music pick up on that, those elements, those themes that are already there? But I think it can be intimidating for both the director and maybe for a young composer starting out to have those discussions because you don't know how to talk to each other or you feel like you don't. But what I love that you guys just conveyed is it's not as complicated. The problem comes when we try to make it complicated, right? You are creating the mood. You are more than anything else, I think, probably music. And I'm biased because I love music. Um, <coughs> but I think music does create the mood, you know, and to go back to a tropey thing, which is the Star Wars Darth Vader theme. Yes, we have this great costume and set design. Yes, we have that wonderful James Earl jo Jones voice. But if you don't have that music, 
does that make the same impression? Maybe, but maybe not, right? It's that one piece that everybody can always go to that everyone remembers and every piano student I've ever taught wants to learn how to play. It's one of the first things kids ask me to learn how to play. How do I play that theme? And I think it underscores it's how mood can really be set by music. Or I love how you both, you all mentioned too, like if you want to twist a trope, if you want to change something and why does this innocent looking little girl have like timpani drums underneath her? What's going on there when you flip it and you do something that's, that's not so expected too. So music can be employed in that way. Is there any other aspects you guys have touched on a lot that you guys would want to offer for either composers working with directors for the first time or directors wanting to talk to composers and feel like they can improve that communication? Um, anything else? I would say, I think but oh, go for it, Dara. Oh, <laughs> I was going to say for, um, for directors to composers, um, you know, bringing them on as soon as possible is always appreciated. Um, no one wants to be able to rush through their art. Um, so if you had six months and you came to us three weeks before you need to deliver something, uh, <laughs> it's like, yeah, we'll do it, but we would have loved to have extra time. <laughs> like we'll always take more time. Um, so the earlier, the, the better. Like, you can give us a script and we can sit on our hands for four months, but we're thinking about it. Um, and, um, and don't feel bad, I guess, for like thinking that we're going to work for six months for still the same fee. Um, we'd, rather, we'd rather be involved as soon as possible. Um, and then also on the other side of that, um, knowing that it is a process between approvals and deliveries. Um, and cause I've had people say, okay, great, this is delivered. So can we have this tomorrow? And I say, well, no, um, <laughs> there's, there's still a process <laughs> that I mentioned, um, you know, especially if you're recording something like, you know, we all have our relationships as well. And we also don't want to rush all of our, um, players and orchestrators and mixers. And, um, you know, the, the team is always happiest when I have at least a little bit of time to do what they can. I mean, and obviously there are ex extenuating circumstances, but just kind of like, just asking ahead of time, what is your lead time that you need between approval and delivery? Um, and I think just being forthcoming with all that information as soon as possible um, will make everyone happier. For sure. Like learn the process, learn yeah. the yeah. process of, of what it means to start conceptualizing the music to delivery and yeah. everything that happens in between. Um, another thing that I would like to say to directors and producers too, budget for music and budget for it, like consider it in your budget beforehand. Oops, sorry, I talked with my hands. Um, so uh, budget for music beforehand. And when you bring on a composer sooner, the better or the more prepared you can be for your your budget and therefore compensating them more fairly. Um, because especially like for me, so being an indie composer, I do everything, you know? So it's, I'm not just clunking my hands on a keyboard and then music just happens to appear. I have to work with virtual instruments and I have to manipulate them to sound human. So adding breath, adding vibrato, adding breaks. Um, and when you're asking for a John Williams-esque piece, okay, that's 60 plus instruments that I have to manipulate in order to make them sound like it's coming from a live orchestra. So it's, you know, composer, orchestrator, copyist, if I were to get live musicians um, and, uh, you know, uh, engineering, mixing, mastering, I do that all myself. Um, and so, I mean, of course I might hire an assistant or two if the budget is, calls for it. But, you know, being in Charlotte, North Carolina, it's a little different than being in Los Angeles. So, um, so yeah, budget for a composer, because a lot of directors that I've worked with, they're just like, all right, well, I got a feature and I got 500 bucks. Can you do this? And I'm like, no, because <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do it in one, one or two weeks. I need at least like a month or two for a feature, maybe even more because I also have other jobs, you know, <laughs> you're not the only director in the universe. <laughs> like, 
So yeah, be considerate of your composer, learn their process, learn what it is that they need to do in order to provide the best product for you and compensate them appropriately. Well, I think, you know, it's absolutely true that lower budget requires more work. And also um, the thing that I want to encourage, you know, both the composers and the directors watching this is to remember that there is a sliding scale that like, it's not indie films or blockbusters. Like there's even like micro budget on this side, you know, like there's, there is no specific like rate sheet for composers. Um, like we will um, be able to work with your budget, you know, almost in any case, even if we're just, you know, like licensing you a track or something, like we can work with tiny budgets. Um, and what we're usually doing with a larger budget um, on top of getting compensated for our um, enormous amount of work um, is, you know, bringing other people into the project, hiring musicians, hiring orchestrators, making this whole machine run more smoothly. And um, one of the things I was thinking about when we were naming other professions within music earlier is that, um, you know, you don't always have any of these people on a project. Sometimes you have like one or two um, who are like helping you with one or two things and you're gonna just do the rest. Um, and different projects are gonna call for, you know, different staffing calls pretty much. Um, so I think that I had a, an idea going in that like film scoring was very rigid, that like there are sort of rules that you follow in terms of like what, um, who you hire, what they do, um, but truly every project is different. If you're starting out, um, it's okay to do small projects. Um, if you, even if you don't feel like you're ready, like score something super small, like that, that's experience. And like, that's not gonna like ruin you if it doesn't work out well. So that's my thought. Yeah, and I love budget because as a, a producer that ran a film festival and, and talks to any filmmakers all the time, there's so many areas that filmmakers forget to budget. You know, and I often talk about your film festival run, like you, you got to put that in your budget and music for sure. You, you need to put that in your budget. I mean, this is important to your film. So put it in there because you wouldn't at the last minute um, just expect someone to come in and shoot and light your film beautifully, even though you forgot to put it in the budget, you know? So it's like, let's start to view music in the same way, like, because it does affect the mood and the effect and the impact of your music of your film just as much. So, you know, giving it that same weight, if you, if you can really, you know, and looking, well, where, how can I even this budget out so that all of it does, because also nothing worse than being a filmmaker and you've done all this great work and you can't take it that last bit, you know, you can't get proper sound design and music scoring in the end or music licensing in the end, it can really hurt you. And, and you put all that other money in and now, you don't really have the right thing to show or it's not going to get the festival run that you want. So, um, and all of that comes back to clear communication as well, right? Maybe talking to composers at the very beginning, this is what I think I can have. Is that not good? If every composer you talk to, you talk to five different ones, they all say that's not going to work for this epic sci-fi thing you're trying to do, then maybe you need to reevaluate that as you're putting your, your budget together, right? So thinking about that and, and communicating well, I think is what I'm hearing from you all, all the way along the way, you know, saying, hey, how long do you think you need for this? Hey, I can't really pay you much more, but is it better for you to have more time? Like I know you guys have mentioned. So communication always, right? Helps every project in <laughs> music and anything. So in yeah. life. <laughs> in yeah. life, right? It's like learn to communicate well and your project will probably be better <laughs> and your life too. Yeah. <laughs> Totally. <laughs> and that also reminds me of just another piece of advice I would give to aspiring composers, which I got early, early in my career as well, which is that like, just keep in mind that um, to all filmmakers, by the time the project is getting to you as a composer, this is their baby. Yeah. Like this is their heart. <laughs> They've spent so much time working on. And like, 
it can sometimes be hard to imagine what the finished product is going to look like when it's at that stage. Like even if we are composers, like before we put any music in, sometimes it can still be hard, like before we've imagined anything. And like, I think just remember to be really like compassionate and grateful that like, um, that someone is sharing with you sharing this with you, even if you, even if you say no, even if it's not a good fit, um, I think it's really important to form relationships um, through that respect. And actually, I'm going to even bounce off of what you're saying too, to composers. If you don't get a gig, it is not because you're not a good composer. It is because your music does not fit their project. And that's okay. You know, it's like, like there's a designer blouse that you've put on and it doesn't look good on you, but it might look good for on someone else because of skin tone, because of shape, because of whatever, like it don't take it personally, you know, I love what you are, love everything who you are um, <clears throat> and your music, you know? So it's just, there will be another project that comes, it's, that comes your way. Um, but don't take it personally. That's that's actually the other number one rule. Don't take anything personally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it feels personal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If it, it does, does feel, feel personal, so personal. You don't have to. <laughs> right. It's like don't don't make it about you. Uh, the other thing is don't be a jerk. Okay, people. Who, yeah, the moment you're a jerk, nobody's going to want to work with you. So be good. Be kind. And first person you have to be kind to is yourself and then be kind to the people that you, you wish to work with. So even if something doesn't work out with a specific project that you wanted, it may happen in the future. Like, well, and you don't know, filmmakers, we talk to each other. So it may be that, you know, I listen to Trinity's work. It doesn't work for this project, but then I'm talking to someone two days later and I'm like, oh, you know whose work would be great for you? Trinity's, but if Trinity was rude to me when I passed on her work, I'm not gonna recommend her, right? Because we're all living and dying on our representation. Rep reputations in this business so you yeah. know it always behooves you to be kind I remember a, a friend of mine's husband he's um, a successful guitarist and he actually played on the like a virgin tour with Madonna and has worked steadily since and he said he's like I am not the best guitarist I am kind and I am on time and good at what I do so I work I have worked in this industry since I started at 20 and he's like not a lot of people can say that that they've worked and made their living just doing music. But he's like, I'm kind, I'm on time, and I'm always prepared. He's like, so there's way better guitarists. He's like, there's people that are more talented to me, but they're jerks, they have an ego, they have a drug problem, they're not on time. So they don't work, they don't make a living doing guitar, but you know, just being nice. <laughs> he's like, basically, I'm just nice. Yeah. So I, I've earned a living doing this. <laughs> I'm like, Oh, because people think, what's the secret to your success? He's like, it's not as complicated as you think. <laughs> like, Kindness. <laughs> yeah. Being I'm pleasant to be around for hours and <laughs> yeah. hours on end. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Humility. I well, mean, I'm only on this panel because a director I worked with and became friends with um, suggested I be here. So here we go. <laughs> right. Kindness, right? It always, it always yeah. works. It always, Thanks, it's all relationships. <laughs> it's all relationships. <laughs> so um, this has been really lovely. As we wrap up, I always like to end with, you know, what are you guys listening to, watching? What are you enjoying? What's creatively getting you inspired? I do that with all my panels. I just think it's cool to hear, like, what's feeding your soul as you are creating, but, like, what gets you going that you like to watch or just wind down to anything? Like, what's, what are you excited to creatively, you know, take in in terms of media right now? So I teach, right? Um, and I'm teaching intro to film music to undergraduate filmmakers. And so I'm basically teaching them how to communicate with a composer. And so, and all the ins and outs of that. So teaching them history, teaching them the uses of the theme, how themes develop and with, and like the process of like spotting sessions, temp tracks, et cetera, et cetera. And um, every week I have them watch a specific film and their assignment is to write on the discussion board, what is the message that this film is trying to convey and to get them into the practice of doing that for their own films too. And so we recently went through Joker and it's interesting because I know that the director in an interview had said that it's about kindness, but 
when analyzing the score for me um, and seeing how the music had developed because Joker's character did not have a theme to begin with. He had textures more so, but as he came to embrace himself and his imperfections, which then became his perfections, he then started to develop a theme. And so, um, so it's just through analyzing film and film scores, like right now I'm watching Westworld and, um, and I'm finding, sorry for the spoilers, but there's more than one world of, I know I'm tar- <laughs> terrible, sorry. Um, but like these different worlds that this company owns or whatever, um, they're using contemporary pieces but they're arranging them or manipulating to sound of that specific world. So whether it's honky tonk piano for Westworld or, um, or something else for another world, I'm not gonna go into the spoilers, but I'm wondering like, what is their song choice? Why or why do they choose these specific songs? Cause you can't hear the lyrics, but obviously they chose the song for a reason. So now my mind is going into the scientific analysis and trying to break things apart. And I just get so excited. Um, and this is the stuff that feeds me and like, you know, the, where I then start to, I get inspired as to how can I write a theme that produces this kind of connection. Um, and that's where all my studying is coming from with, again, the idea of psychology and creating associations to having multiple senses stimulated at the same time to where then they become, they retain as a memory. And so that's why like my slogan for my film or for my business is the secret to immortalizing film um, because of that multi-sensory experience that we composers create to then have, um, to then retain films as an experience and as a memory. So the best films and therefore film scores um, have, are completely immortalized, right? Like every time we hear John Williams, we think of Steven Spielberg's films or, you know, vice versa. So it's just fascinating to me. So anyway, and anal- analyzing stuff, that's what <laughs> inspires me and in watching just a bunch of content. <laughs> well, and you made me realize like the Stand By Me soundtrack, which is, is brought, not really, you know, score, but soundtrack. It's like, that's my childhood right there. Like when I hear mm-hmm. any song from that soundtrack, like I'm like 10 years old again. And I'm immediately like with my best friend from that time in my life. Like it just like, it did immortalize itself. Like the way they use music in that film, like so effectively, it's like, it's, it's a time machine. So it definitely does that. What about the others? What are you guys getting inspired by? What are you listening to, enjoying, watching? I mean, when I'm, sure, when, I, when I'm done with the day, um, I'm trying to turn my brain off as much as possible. Um, I, I, I work like, you know, 12 to 16 hour days and I'm done. Um, and <laughs> so I enjoy it. Like I'll, I'll listen in a, and appreciate a good score when I'm watching stuff, but really I just, I just want to laugh and not think about the rest of it. Um, I really loved watching The Great um, on Hulu. It was a lot of fun. Um, I, I definitely got into it a little later than it first came out, but um, I started watching it again and um, yeah, it was just, great to, uh, pun intended, Um, to just kind of follow someone else's story and put yours on a, on a rack for a little bit. Um, But, uh, you know, lots of different scores um, inspire me. I really liked, I really liked the Tenant score um, with Ludwig Gornson. Um, I love most anything Daniel Pemberton has done. Um, Same with Nick Bartel. Um, I love Ronique Kirchman's score to the center. And I tell her this all the time. She's like, stop. Um, <laughs> and um, there's a show that I actually didn't finish watching the show, but I did finish listening to the score um, because I found it really interesting, which is um, The Servant on Apple Plus. And I'm like, I got a few episodes in. I'm like, I, I, I plan to go back and finish it, um, but I have, you know, limited amount of hours. Um, but, you know, this is something I can listen to in the car. Um, and kind of, I, I think the cart um, is where I do most of my listening, even though I don't drive anywhere now. So my listening has um, atrophied, but um, yeah, just lots of stuff. I love weird textures um, and thinking like, how do they, how do they make that sound? <laughs> and then, you know, you go home and you mess around with some stuff. Um, so yeah, I just love anything that's kind of strange. 
That's cool. Yeah. Gary, you mentioned mine because I was going to say tenant the score. I, yeah. I loved that score. So cool. Yeah. I think everything he does is just like so interesting. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, honestly, like kind of same thing where like I, I guess I'm not working as long days as I once was because of the pandemic um, and because of like self-care because of the pandemic. Um, so, but still like I'm very burnt out at the end of the day and I usually just like want to watch like a game show or a stupid reality show. Um, and I am commuting to my studio right now because it's an isolated studio. Um, <clears throat> but what always makes me really smile is turning on like a rock station and hearing some great like 2000s like 90s 2000s alt rock like paramore came on the other day and i was like yes well, that is exactly what i want to listen to um and uh yeah so rocking out to any good 2000s rock i'm gonna be honest vulnerable for a second that like you know since the pandemic I've been super depressed and like, I'm like, okay. Um, but like, I have not been as creative or as productive as I would really like to be this year. Um, and I'm like, okay with the fact that that happened because this is where we are. Um, but like, I'm just really glad that I have a therapist that I like and would definitely recommend that to anybody who um, has not experienced that <laughs> you are the second time that I've had a panelist end with this and this was a really like this is a, a director that she's doing stuff with Apple TV she's an amazing talented director and that was her one advice she, I was like what's your takeaway advice for creatives and she's like go to therapy like that was her like takeaway so I'm glad you Everybody. got it back there like I've heard <laughs> this theme so many times during my zoom panels for um COVID and yeah we can only be creative um beings if we are loving and taking care of ourselves or only be really in, into our creative selves, I think, be connected to them. So I think that's great. And yeah, we don't have to do heavy stuff at the end of the day. I was on a Top Chef binge at the first of this pandemic. I was like, I'm just gonna watch a bunch of Top Chef. And all of my research projects are related to really deep topics, like genocide, and mass incarceration. So it's like, people are like, have you watched 13th? I was like, Nope, I'm watching Top Chef because I read about all of those issues all day for my work. So I'm I'm watching Top Chef and I'm not gonna feel guilty about it. <laughs> like yeah. so yeah, I think to create it's like listen to the music that is nostalgia for us or that makes us happy and take care of ourselves. I think that that's the perfect place to end because we can't we can't create if we're not doing that. So that's a that's a great place to end. And I really appreciate all of your time. Thank you for sharing it with me from different parts of the US. And um, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, finally, how can people connect with you? Um, just a real quick, like how can people find you? We're gonna have it you know, listed as well, but if there's a real quick shout out you wanna give for the best way to reach you, let's, I'm gonna give you a chance to do that now too. Sure, um, Instagram, Facebook, um, kind of Clubhouse. Um, everything is at real scoring, R-E-E-L scoring, which is my business. So it's really easy because that tag is all social media. So just type at real scoring and Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, but I'm mostly on Instagram and Facebook these days, more Instagram than Facebook because I'm getting tired of Facebook. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say a similar thing. I mean, you can email me dara at daratellermusic.com or contact me through my website. Um, but yeah, I guess Instagram, don't try Facebook or Twitter. Um, I, I will see it in six months and, <laughs> and I'll be like, oh yeah, hey. Um, so <laughs> I tell them like, great, send me an email. I'm not going to be on here any longer. Um, so <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll have things feed there, but you know, time is precious and <laughs> I'd rather not spend it on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much the same thing here, um, edithmudge.com. You can contact me through there or edith at edithmudge.com. Um, my Instagram is at composer edith.m.mudge. Um, still working on consolidating all my social media to be similar, but the one I spend the most time on is Instagram. 
Um, I still don't check it very often, so please don't be insulted if uh, I don't get back to you immediately. But I would love to connect with anybody who would like to connect. Well, thank you guys. Thank you so much. Um, and I wish you all a much better 2021 than I'm assuming we all had in 2020. Um, and thank you again for your time. All right. Thank, thank you all you for joining so us at this new high channel.